Sure. Yeah, I would. Uh, I would love to see photos of your trip to Salon. All right. <clears throat> we have to talk about The Sims 4 history of co-opting culture. The Idle Living Expansion Pack came out in 2019, and that is too many years too late for our company to be feeding us these loose interpretations of exotic cultures. The Sims 4 Pack borrows motifs and theories from the Polynesian islands through the lens of tiki culture from the mid-1900s in the US. And the result? If you're not seeing what I'm seeing, please stick around. There are a number of reasons that this pack felt flat, but the uninspired build-by offerings that showcased very little of what the South Pacific is actually about definitely didn't help. A few quick disclaimers. I am a white queer person who uses he, them pronouns, and today I'm gonna to be talking about a culture that is not my own. My goal is to discuss my country's role in the commodification of Polynesian culture and demonstrate how colonization is thriving today through some really cool merchandise like The Sims 4 Island Living. While I've done a lot of research for this silly little video on the internet, I am not a historian or an expert in South Pacific cultures, just a customer who wants better for major corporations trying to capitalize on communities of color. And that's a lot of C's. This video is also a continuation of my Sims 4 review series called Can My Sims Survive? In this series, we review each pack from The Sims 4 using a predetermined, consistent set of criteria to see if my sim has all that they need to live a fulfilling virtual life with only the items included in the pack. For each video, I create a new build using the items from the review pack plus base game when needed. While the tone of this video will definitely be different than the first videos I've made, we're going to use the same criteria to judge. Overall, our goal is to understand what we're getting for our money and to help us all better compare the objects and items included from pack to pack. I've split this video up into chapters in case you're only interested in a specific portion. First, we're going to talk a little bit about the history and recent resurgence of tiki culture and see specifically how that plays out in The Sims 4 Island Living. Then we'll talk through my vernacular speed build of Sulani's first open air museum. If you're into this type of Sims content, please let me know by hitting the like button. And with that, we're going to start with a little story, which I promise is related to The Sims. Now, I know we've all been to a tiki themed attraction, restaurant, hotel, resort, whatever. But did you know that the tiki craze was started by a white guy who credits his trips to the Caribbean as a kid as his inspiration for all things tiki? and that all subsequent iterations of tiki experiences have been primarily created and maintained by white people? Yeah, right. So, let's clear some things up real quick. These are the countries that are part of the South Pacific, also referred to as Polynesia. Big topic today. And these are the countries that are part of the Caribbean. Not as big of a topic, but indeed the inspiration for our antagonist of this story, very different. So, if the origin of tiki culture doesn't make much sense to you, buckle up because, spoiler alert, this is the through line. Don Beach, founding father of tiki culture, originally born as Ernest Raymond Gant, opened the first ever tiki bar in 1933 after a few years of traveling the world. It was called Don's Beachcomber. Before this, our friend Don was a bootlegger. <laughs> no, not a bootlicker, bootlegger meaning he illegally smuggled alcohol for his day job. His Polynesian-style bar opened up just as Prohibition was outlawed. And the main draw? Exotic cocktails inspired by Don's travels to Latin America. And the Bahamas. <laughs> oh, and food that was primarily Cantonese. Yeah, from China. <laughs> so, okay. The food and drink weren't Polynesian, but Don was a wizard when it came to making rum-based cocktails with exotic ingredients. In reality, he had taken simple, traditional recipes from abroad and made them incredibly complex, using ingredients from all over the world. Not really the South Pacific Islands. But it didn't matter. Tiki was quickly adopted as the ultimate in escapism, and the Hollywood elite flocked to Don's restaurant in mass to taste the tastes they had never tasted before. <laughs> Don's goal was to sell the fantasy of island living by making the reality of island life more palatable for white, affluent patrons. 
the craze began and tiki was in. But quick note, unsurprisingly, the word tiki was borrowed and actually has a pretty specific meaning. In Maori mythology, which is a Polynesian culture based in New Zealand, Tiki is the first man in existence, ever, who happened to find the first woman in existence, ever. You get the rest. By extension, a Tiki is a large or small wooden stone carving in humanoid form. That's it. But, thanks to Don, Tiki became the catch-all term for anything that evoked the mystery of the islands. Tiki torches, Tiki drinks, Tiki parties, and Tiki life. The success of Don's Beachcomber almost immediately prompted imitators. One bar became two, two became a competitor's franchise, and within 20 years, Tiki style found its way into hotels, motels, apartment buildings, bowling alleys, and even amusement parks. Looking at you, Disney. Americans were having wild, uninhibited luau's in their backyard on the weekend and stuffing a crisp white button-down shirt into their suit pants come Monday morning. Tiki culture became a band-aid over post-war industrialism and newly emerging 9-to-5 culture, instead putting emphasis on a slower, carefree lifestyle. Tiki really helped people be themselves during a stressful span of economic rebuilding. And in 1959, the peak of the Tiki craze, Hawaii became the 50th state of the United States, which, uncoincidentally, uh, was the same year that commercial jet travel was introduced. Finally, the promise and fantasy of the tiki lifestyle was just a short plane ride away for the American people. There was a catch, though. (laughs) Yeah, if you hadn't picked up on it yet, Polynesian people weren't really invited into this craze, unless, of course, you were playing the object of affection or awe while performing traditional arts like hula for white audiences. I think it's also important to note that Christian missionaries and eventually the U.S. were heavily involved in attempting to eradicate those same traditional arts some 100 years prior when we were introducing Christian values to the South Pacific and when we ultimately overthrew the Hawaiian monarchy. So that's an oversimplification, but I digress. Now, Hawaii has a long, slow, and dismal history of colonization that I don't have time to get into today. But it is relevant. The Sims 4 Island Living borrows a lot from the South Pacific, but Sulani is almost certainly and primarily based on Hawaiian tourism, which also sparked Disney's curiosity when creating the Polynesian, which also sparked Disney's curiosity when creating the Polynesian, jeez, why can't I fucking say this line? Which also sparked Disney's curiosity when creating the Polynesian Village Resort. Keep an eye out for similarities, Disney fans. Wink. Okay, so what is the connection here? Yes, The Sims 4 packaged up some loosely referenced island theme objects and called it a pack. Why does it matter? Well, Tiki culture and The Sims 4 have one major thing in common. The commodification and simplification of mythology and culture to appease the masses. Oh, (laughs) amendment? Without the acknowledgement or inclusion of said culture. As I was exploring the items that came with this pack, It was obvious that the developers were either culturally inexperienced, too scared, or plainly unable to push the overall aesthetic in a direction that had more basis in indigenous customs. Like tiki culture, island living is an amalgamation of trendy, uninspired resort wear and a dream of paradise that's been pushed through a corporate trainer twice to yield the most universal, albeit bland, flavor that they could muster. The result is a vaguely familiar trip to a coast in a place that reminds you of an experience you may have had, or you did, and uh, maybe at least you want to. And the longer you tread down that rabbit hole, the design themes and gameplay mechanics of island living get ever more hazy. This pack gives us jet skiing and sunburn, in place of culturally significant objects and items. Alright, let's look at some examples. As a reminder, I am no expert in Polynesian culture, I'm only looking to share what I've learned through some investigative and intentional googling. Very open to corrections in the comments, please forgive my pronunciations in the following segment. Okay, first up, one of the central items uh, and interactions of island living is the Sulani Volcanic Barbecue Sear. These are also known as earth ovens, and this was my first clue to the pack's Hawaiian influence because of its style. Earth ovens have been used throughout history, across the globe, but Hawaiians uniquely top their earth ovens in vegetation while cooking. So, there you go. Here's the thing. 
Earth ovens are incredibly labor intensive, especially this style, so they were really only created for special events or ceremonies where it would be worth the time and hard work to make. The inclusion of this earth oven in island living is significant in identifying the pack's influences and does ground it in a particular island, but it's also somewhat misguided in how accessible an item like this may have been in day-to-day -day life. All right, we've been talking about tiki culture this whole time. How about the tiki wall sculpture? So this tiki looks pretty jovial, right? Big old tongue sticking out. <laughs> so what's the issue, aside from the very obvious heavy-handedness here? Tiki with their tongue sticking out are considered warriors, and in Maori haka performance, this gesture is used to assert power or dominance, intimidate, or challenge. I read a lot of interpretations on this one, um, but I don't imagine that any of them are what the Sims team wanted to capture in this object, which also happens to be an object that's pretty critical in selling the feeling of this pack. Okay, so how about some furniture then? This pack features a ton of items made of wicker or handwoven rattan, which wouldn't you know, originate from Indonesia and China. <laughs> and if we take a quick look at that list from earlier, we realize that neither of these locations are within the South Pacific. Wicker and Rattan's associations with Polynesian culture actually date back to Don's very first tiki bar. Many of those original bars were actually decorated by Hollywood set designers. And since then, a combination of Asian art, Indonesian influence, and what became tiki style has transformed what people expect from Polynesian art and architecture. Fine, build mode. Let's look at build mode. This pack comes with a few wallpapers, and one of them has the appearance of woven grass or wood. Seems legit. I came up with a couple ideas that may have been the reference point here, but neither of them quite fit. For example, grass cloth is one of the oldest wallpapers in known history. However, it originated in China, and began replacing silk wallpaper as a cheaper alternative. That being said, weaving was definitely a part of Polynesian culture. Polynesian ohe, which is a type of bamboo, and lauhala are two plant species that are native to the South Pacific. While it's possible that these walls uh, from island living are made of either bamboo or lauhala, weaving these botanicals was historically used for much smaller objects, like sleeping in work mats, baskets, and hats. In general, actually, it was tough to find images or illustrations of authentic indigenous Polynesian dwellings with woven walls. If a structure did have walls, the walls were usually thatched. And if they were woven, the weave was generally looser, less perfected, and inconsistent. This motif also seems to have been popularized much later through tiki culture and adopted through tourism to elicit the feeling of a more primitive and authentic environment. So... In a lot of ways, to me, this just feels like a tiki resort pack. The major motifs used through key items that make the pack feel how it feels actually originate from other areas of our world than the South Pacific. And that's a shame. Like, if you visit a Polynesian island, you'll see hotels and businesses and even homes that look like island living. You absolutely will. The issue is that the style of architecture and interior designs featured in this pack have a tangled relationship with colonization and the bastardization of indigenous cultures. There is still a thriving community of primarily white people that participate in tiki culture to this day. After a resurgence through the mid-80s and 90s, a generation of people that never experienced the original craze are finding comfort, identity, and solidarity from a time that they did not live through. People who dress and live the tiki lifestyle today are still chasing that idea of an escape to paradise, and unfortunately, seem even further removed from the origins of tiki style. Through decades of appropriation and the blending of exotic cultures from across the globe, tiki style is now uniquely American, and the folks that continue to pursue this lifestyle are able to easily disassociate from its roots and instead claim it for their own, because... Essentially, they made it. Often, a concept like island living is worn as a badge of honor for diversity and inclusivity. It's touted as representation for marginalized groups who don't have a face in big media. But in many cases, the folks who are being featured are not included in the development of the project, or cast as actors, or in the writing room. The result is a final product that can be misinformed, or worse, help to perpetuate the stereotypes that have held back these communities for generations, like tiki culture to people of Polynesian descent. 
and here we are. I think when this pack came out, most people felt that Sulani was dull and lifeless, despite taking place in such a naturally beautiful and geographically interesting environment. While much of this feeling can be explained by empty community lots and a general lack of unique gameplay, I think that some of it can also be attributed to the lack of direction and authenticity in the set pieces we were provided with for Build and Buy. This all leads me to our build for today. As we've covered, Sulani is very much lacking in culture and community, so I wanted to create a lot that highlights actual vernacular Hawaiian structures. Vernacular architecture is outlined as being local construction made with the use of locally available materials, practices, and knowledge. Vernacular building prioritizes function over aesthetic and is not limited to one style in particular. This means that each culture has unique vernacular structures that develop over time based on geography, climate, and available resources. Sometimes vernacular is interchanged with the word traditional, but there is actually a difference between these terms. Using the word vernacular implies a building's dependency on a specific location and learned set of cultural practices, kind of like the original sustainable design theory. Conversely, saying a building is traditional does not eliminate the possibility of importing materials or borrowing building techniques from past conquests and neighboring towns. So what you see behind me is Sulani's first open air museum featuring three vernacular buildings of the Hawaiian people. These structures are called hale, which means home, but it's also used as a generic reference to any building or lodge. Each building on this lodge with a thatched roof has a different classification. The central structure is called hale halawai, typically known to have no walls and a stone base. This structure was used as a meeting house, often functioning as the center of a community. The domed structure is called hale noa, a common house for a family to sleep, rest, and commune. Because of the building restrictions here, I had to put an entrance on the narrow side of the building rather than the wide side. I do wish that we had thatched wallpaper with this pack that matched the roof because I think that that would have made for a more authentic interpretation here. And the smaller single roof structure attached to the back of the visitor center is called Hale Kuai, uh, also known as a lean-to or gable style. These could serve a number of work-related purposes and were constructed much more quickly than the other featured structures on this lot. Sadly, um, Halle fell out of fashion for nearly a century due to colonization. Only in the past 20 years have these structures been legalized once again for new construction and residential use. To build these Halle, I used a combination of island living pillars and spandrels paired with a lot of wooden debug items from base game to help sell the idea that they were made using found local materials. And a lot of move objects cheat. <laughs> Two of these structures are anchored by stonework, and while I felt the included foundations and platform trims were a good base, they ultimately felt a little too tidy on their own. So I used a lot of base game rocks and volcanic debug rocks from Island Living to help sell the idea that these foundations were stacked by hand. I also used the roof decor to add a bit more detail to the roof lines since they were feeling really flat, although this is definitely a deviation from the reference imagery just to make something that works a bit better in-game. To me, the final structures still feel a bit too ceremonial compared to my reference images because of the textiles on the spandrels and pillars, but I did my best with what they gave us. I also wanted to include a small section of wet farming, as Hawaii has a very rich history of agriculture. Since we don't have a ton of gameplay items in this pack, I figured a little gardening on the community lot as a method of learning indigenous practices might be a nice touch. We can pretend this is how they farm kava in-game, since it can't actually be grown. Okay, so <laughs> I think I've made my case for how I feel about the overall aesthetic of this pack, but we really haven't talked about our, our general criteria for this review series. So first we're going to talk about the equal distribution of objects across all categories. And look, we're going to check out exact numbers at the end of this build, but I will admit that this pack is stacked. Island Living is an expansion pack and it was treated like an expansion pack from a build and buy perspective. Technically, every category has representation and you will be able to sustain all of your Sims needs using only the items from this pack. There were a couple gaps for me. Um, I wish that we had matching cabinets with the new counter sets. Um, and I guess we have we have plumbing items. So we have like a tub and a shower that are, are like very stylistic and wooden, but we didn't get a toilet with them. But we also have a lot of toilets in base game, so this wasn't huge. And then I think another thing worth noting too is that for kids, if you like family gameplay, there's only one item in this pack. 
specifically geared towards kids and it's like a rustic swing set. I did add that to the back of the slot towards the end of the build just for something else to do if you download this into your game. As for base game cohesion, I, I think it's close enough. I'm not sure if Island Living came out before or after the major base game update that added a ton of new swatches, but I think there is enough overlap in wood tones and color palettes that you can make these two packs work together pretty easily. I think it is worth noting that most of the builds that were shipped with Island Living don't use a ton of base game objects. Solani makes really heavy use of the items that are included in the pack. I think the only tough thing about blending these two packs is the very stylistic nature of Island Living items. Whereas they'll definitely look fine mixed with base game items, they often overpower a space and they'll transport your design to Tiki Resort territory quick. There are a few basics that you can get away with here though, but that's just something to consider. Um, once you start using Island Living, you're going to be in a resort. Island Living encourages us to sit back and relax, engage in local culture, and rock the island vibes. And I think that really summarizes the plastic experience that we've been handed here. Let's check out some of our final scorecards to see where the pack landed. For me, Island Living has cleared all of our predetermined criteria and done so pretty easily. If you like the look and feel of this pack, then you'll really have an easy time making a nice life for your sim. The areas where we fall short are not intended to be captured by this series, those areas being gameplay opportunities and, I guess, an ability to read the damn room. I'm pretty happy with how my build turned out, but I did need to enhance the included items quite a bit with base game debug just to deliver something that feels a bit more authentic to Polynesian and specifically Hawaiian culture. I'm not sure how much further I could take the items in this pack beyond their very obvious intended uses. And as mentioned, the style of this pack can be pretty limiting for more general builds. Anyway, <laughs> I hope you all had an enlightening trip to Sulani today. If you would like to see more of this series, please let me know in the comments. I think Jungle Adventure would be a good contender for part two, and maybe City Living and Snowy Escape, all to varying degrees. Anyway, uh, if you'd like to see more from me, please feel free to hit the subscribe button. And if you like this video, please be sure to like it. It's very helpful. I'm just getting started. And otherwise, until next time, y'all.